All right, everyone. And uh, I am so ex just like, anyway, my, again, my name is Crystal Porter. I'm the executive director of MN Renewable Now. And um, we co-hosted this viewing with Minneapolis Climate Action. Uh, this movie was very alarming and it reignited my disdain for single use plastic products for sure. Um, one thing I wanted to point out before I introduce the panelists is um, about this about plastic bags is uh, we were able to outlaw them and just last year it was rolled back yet again. Um, and the lobbyist group that was responsible for getting that to pass was a group called Ameripen. Um, I am actually sharing a link of that organization. It's a lobbyist group. Um, and Ameripen is, are a lobbyist that bounce around the entire country and is monitoring about 450 bills right now uh, with registered lobbyists all over the country, um, from California to Oregon to Maine. Um, and they actually, the members of this group are General Mills, Dow Chemical, Procter & Gamble, PepsiCo, um, and many other groups that create generic products that, um, that wrap up our out food and granola bars and, and all of those little convenience items. So um, I'm not going to take any more uh, time from that. Um, but what I do want to do, oh, well, Kyle, um, did you want to mention the, um, our zero waste, um, zero waste committee before, um, I introduce the panelists? Oh, sure. I can, I can do that and we'll get to that later as well. Okay. Um, very quickly, I will say if people want to turn on their video, they can, if they want to, um, now just look at everyone's lovely face, um, but keep yourself muted unless you're a panelist talking. And Christelle will get to any questions, so put those in the um, chat um, and she will ask them for you. Um, and yes, we are going to hand out resources, a resource um, guide to everyone who's participated tonight that will include all kinds of things that we learned about tonight, organizations. Um, and with that, we will get, um, right into introducing our fabulous panel. Yes, and so we have uh, Steve Wilson. Steve Wilson is the executive producer and um, co-director of Peak Plastic Foundation. He represents Peak Plastic Foundation. And then Priscilla Villa Watts from Eureka Recycling. Uh, we also have our state representative, Frank Hornstein and uh, Jenna Grove from Clean Water Action. So they're all here to have a, a wonderful conversation about um, this movie and um, this issue. Um, and I will just kind of take a back seat while um, our different panelists introduce themselves. If we could just make sure that the panelists stay muted until they are ready to talk. Um, and then um, folks, if you could stay muted, but please, like uh, Kyle said, any questions that you have, just put them in the, in the chat box um, on the on below or on the right and I will read through them and I'll be able to ask those questions to the panelists in um, in your honor. So um, take it away. I believe um, Stiv was going to go first or was it Priscilla? I can't remember. Stiv was going to jump in first because yep. he has to go after That's what I thought. in a little bit. So all right. Too. Welcome Stiv. Hi, everybody. Um, good to be here. Uh, I am a native Minnesotan. I grew up in South Minneapolis, so um, I'm currently in San Francisco, but fun to be beaming into your living rooms from afar, and I'm glad you watched our movie. Um, the story of plastic represents about a 10-year journey for me. Uh, when I when I started my career, I was looking at oceanic plastic pollution, mainly uh, did some research in the Great Lakes as well, and started with advocacy campaigns. But as I, you know, kind of got more into the issue, I was looking where, you know, the sources of this pollution and realized that that is a whole other story. Um, plastic is pollution, from my perspective, the second it comes out of the ground as, um, oil and gas. And so about eight, nine years ago, I took a trip to the Philippines. Uh, and you just saw a lot of my friends and colleagues that are in this film. Uh, 
And I went to this place called Smoky Mountain, which is a landfill that people live in and mine for whatever they can sell. So typically making about a dollar, dollar fifty a day by rice, um, by water, uh, and they will actually garden within the landfill itself. And it sort of like was a moment where I really understood the humanitarian issue that plastic pollution causes because of you know how we handle and export our waste depending where we live in the United States uh, and the effect it has on developing world countries. And uh, I vowed about nine years ago standing in that uh, landfill to make this movie because I wanted to really put forward what the whole system looked like. And while we were shooting, um, we met Priscilla, who's uh, also a panelist here. At the time, she was doing some organizing for a group called Earthworks before she came to Eureka Recycling. And she was a field, organize, field organizer um, for Earthworks working out of Carnes County. Um, and folks that are living in the shadow of uh, the extraction process. And you know, meeting Priscilla and her colleague and both of our friend, Yvette, who's also featured very prominently, they sort of were the, the people who were gonna supply the extraction side of the story. And we got to know a lot of community organizers and concerned citizens in Texas, and we were able to put the whole system together. So part of the intention of the story of plastic is to sort of convert the convert, the already converted, because I think at times we are making policies or we're making mitigation strategies that are based on only one part of the system, and that's after disposal. And we really wanted, um, our production team really wanted to demonstrate the whole system and show the breadth and color of people who are affected by this material from the moment it's born to the moment um, uh, it's gone and the sort of mysteria of life of plastic before it comes to you and what happens to it afterwards. So that was the overall intention. I'm blown away at the reception of the film. Um, never, you know, whenever you do a project like this, you never think it's gonna get that far, especially documentaries. Uh, but having it appear on Discovery Network on Earth Day was like a dream come true. And I'm just honored and humbled by this movement of people all over the world who are utilizing this tool. And to some degree, it's, it's really, really nice to have something compact, succinct, and uh, a tool that any group in the world can use for free to engage with their stakeholders and their communities and their constituents. So um, thanks a lot for hosting this tonight. And again, um, really pleased to be beaming into the Twin Cities. Thank you, Stiv. Um, does anyone have any questions for Stiv at all while he is here before he takes off? And give people a second to unmute themselves if they uh, if they want. If you have any examples of good countries or states that have extended producer responsibility legislation that we can copy. Yeah, there's been a good policy effort um, in the United States that is mirrored the EU circular economy package, which was passed uh, last year. Um, and it covers all EU member states. It's about a population of about 500 million. And uh, there's components of that EPR legislation that gets to producer responsibility. It does outright ban um, single-use products. Uh, Franz Timmerman was talking about it a bit uh, in the film, but ultimately it got rid of things that were easily replaceable or could be supplanted with reusables. Uh, and then it also mandated that the producers need to pay for end of life. And there's actually a certification. If you buy a bottle of, laundry detergent in Paris, it's gonna have a little symbol on the back that says a producer pays into a fund to help the management at end of life. So uh, my state of California, I worked with a coalition of folks here to put forward Senate Bill 54 and Assembly Bill 1080, which are identical. Um, 
and it goes a little bit farther than the EU circular economy directive, but uh, increasingly Western states are looking at this legislation um, now next uh, legislative season. But um, if anybody's interested, I would definitely read uh, Senate Bill 54 and Assembly Bill 1080 uh, in California for ideas on getting a producer responsibility, as well as the EU circular economy directive. Um, is there any other questions for Stiv before he, he leaves us? Hey, Stiv, would you put those bill um, numbers in the chat for us? I thought I could uh, type it that quickly and I couldn't, <laughs> even though it was short. Yeah. All right. Cool. All right. So next, um, I'm going to introduce um, Priscilla Villawatt, and she is a uh, she's from Eureka Recycling, a nonprofit um, recycling company right here in the Twin Cities. Hey, Priscilla, take it away. Cool. Thanks, Crystal. Hey, everybody. Um, yeah. So my name is Priscilla. I am now with Eureka. I've been at Eureka since in since January, um, and I've actually been in Minnesota for about six months. Um, as you may have heard, so prior to that, I was organizing in South Texas, working directly with um, communities who are impacted by oil and gas extraction. Um, and I was a part of the uh, Break Free from Plastics movement, really kind of helping to make the connections between um, plastic pollution that's happening up at the at the well site, at the extraction site. Um, which, as Steve mentioned, was a part of the pro which was a part of the problem that was kind of missing from the story um, of plastic pollution. Uh, and you know, it's interesting because I was I can tell you everything and anything that has to do with fracking. Um, but I, at the time, you know, three and four years ago, wasn't necessarily aware that plastic was also seen as a fossil fuel and that it was the next big fossil fuel that oil companies were going to focus on and try to create profits out of. Um, and so part of the work that I do at Eureka that's sort of connected to my previous organizing work is um, really looking at, you know, how do we cut the supply? How do we, how do we um, in Minnesota um, and other places where there isn't as much extraction, get to the um, production of plastic, how do we cut that off, right? And, and show through our um, votes, through our um, purchases, through our consumption, that plastic is not something or a material that we necessarily want to invest in and want to continue to see in our grocery stores um, and in the products that we use every day. So a lot of the work that I'm doing now is mostly on um, policy development, individual action, community action, getting at how um, we reduce single-use plastic, um, but also, again, getting to, the, getting to that core issue of how do we just reduce plastic production overall? How do we show investors and oil companies that this is not something consumers want, but rather this is just a product that there's just an oversupply of um, that's, driving that, um, that's driving that demand. So um, you may have seen in the film the the flare and the frac sites that um, were were shown in Texas, and you know that's real life for for people every day, for people living with insomnia because of their because of light pollution from those flares, for people living with chronic um, illnesses to this day, and so this is a real you know issue for for people on a daily basis. And um, bringing that to light, I'm so grateful for Stiv and the whole Surya Plastics team for. Um, really showing that and emphasizing that plastic is a problem, again, once it comes out of the ground. So, thanks. Yeah, uh, Priscilla, I remember taking a group of, of youth to Eureka Recycling a few different times, and I was in awe and amazed at the staff that had to work so quickly to try to pull out the different things and the different materials that weren't weren't recyclable and even after step one two three four and five there still was 
so many other things that were that still weren't able to get and so so much of of the the waste still went into the trash and it just was really heartbreaking and i just um very thankful for the work that eureka does um to to manage um our plastics and our recyclables it's got to be very frustrating, especially, um, you know, because recycling is a very confusing um, a thing to participate in. And all, the general public just has a really hard time of, um, of learning to separate those things correctly. Ralph had a question. Um, Ralph Jacobson. Um, welcome, Ralph. He is actually the, uh, the, he has a long history of representing the solar industry in Minnesota with IPS Solar. Um, and he had a question for you. Um, he said, or uh, let's see, where is it? Okay. He said, is there really any useful plastic recycling and is there anything we can do to support that? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so we had a great, <laughs> we actually had a webinar, Eureka hosted a web webinar today, uh, 1 PM, which I'm happy to share with, with y'all, um, about, why recycling and recyclers are such a big part of the, so the solution now to deal with the amount of plastics that we have. Um, so just to, to give you an idea, at Eureka, we, um, we recycle 93% of what comes through our door, which means that seven, only 7% 7 isn't getting recycled. And that's huge. That is not an industry norm. Um, and that has a lot to do with the fact that we are a local nonprofit recycler. And I think something that you saw in the film is that recycling is not something that is, there's no global standard, there's no federal standard, there's no state standard. It's really just depends on local consumption, um, outreach. So like what kinds of education you're, you're doing to the community. And the other big factor is markets. So um, I believe, I'm trying to remember what his name was, the, the person who was this, the recycler from California, he was talking about how when China Sword hit, they weren't able to recycle a lot of their plastics because they had been shipping their plastics out to China. So Eureka, we actually um, recycle most of our plastic, most of our products, plastic and others, stay in this region, in this region. So like I think 90% stays in the state of Minnesota and then 10% goes out to the larger Midwest area. Um, and that's rare. We just happen to be in a really great place to have the markets that are needed to buy and purchase the materials that need to be recycled. Um, so there's a strong emphasis there at the end for community-based projects around zero waste. And I think the same can be said for recycling. Um, again, those markets are available, and that's really what makes um, the materials that you put in your recycling bins um, so recyclable. Like, that's, that's really the sort of magic there. Um, and I think in terms of, again, going back to, to plastics, um, while some of it is downcycled, a lot of it can be upcycled. So you have, like, um, uh, your milk jugs can be melted down into milk, can be turned into milk jugs again. Laundry detergent bottles are a great example. Those get turned right back into um, uh, plastic lumber, which is pretty resilient. Um, so it just kind of depends on the material. But again, getting at policies that reduce single-use plastics that cannot be recycled, that we cannot um, recycle, are where we want to really focus our attention. Because that's, that ends up becoming waste, that ends up becoming incinerated. Um, burnt off or goes to a landfill. And that's just not something that we as a, recy as a recycling organization can, can handle. And that's not unique to us. That's just the system that we, that we live in. You know, and, and just quickly to follow up that it, it, we are lucky in Minnesota, I think, to have some of the better recycling infrastructure. And thanks to Eureka, we have, I think, a unique situation and it's still so critical wherever possible, even if something can be recycled, that if it's possible to avoid that plastic in the first place, I mean, it really is that reduce reuse that I truly believe has to come first and then, you know, work on the absolutely necessary legislation that standardizes recycling labeling and stuff. Um, and maybe I'm just, I'm just still like, so raw from how much companies have gotten away with with 
using recycling as a band-aid. Mm -hmm. you know? And of course, it's important to recycle correctly, but yeah. Um, yeah, I, think, oh, yeah sorry. I, just, I just want to emphasize that you're absolutely right. I think, you know, we sort of see recycling as a solution for the problem that we have now, but we definitely don't see recycling as a, we can't recycle our way out of this problem. That's for sure. Um, and part of our mission is, is that waste is preventable. So as much as we can prevent it from coming into our hands, getting to our, to our stores um, where we actually consume it is, is really what we're focused on. Um, I have, Natasha has a question for you. She said, we often do community cleanups. And she said, if plastic sits in a ditch and is exposed to the sun, can it still be recycled? Ooh, that's uh, a technical question that's probably better for one of our um, co-presidents. But what I can do is I'll write that down um, and ask and ask about that. It's a great question. Mm -hmm. And then um, Ralph asked another question. I noticed that 3M got a dishonorable mention in the film. Has the company been engaged in responsible products? Um, do you know? I, as far as I know, I, I'm not sure. Um, there, uh, there is sort of this um, effort with Break Free From Plastic, the, the movement generally to work with brands um, to make better products and materials um, that are either recyclable or compostable or just you know, don't, are reusable. Um, but I don't know company specific who that is um, and how that works. And then Andrea, she made a uh, mention and she said that the upstream waste, uh, waste slide from Eureka webinar was very powerful. So she wanted to uh, mention that. And uh, she mentioned that for every one bin of materials, there are many, many more upstream. And then Kyle said that she was going to share that with everybody, that webinar with everyone. So thank you for doing that, Kyle. We'll get um, that from Eureka. Yeah. Does anyone have any more questions for Priscilla at all? All right. So if I could say one last thing <laughs> through yes. Rika is that um, I, I know I heard you say, Crystal, that um, recycling can be confusing. And I think one of the biggest reasons that it can be confusing is because you have these um, messages that are coming from outside of the state. Um, come, I mean, I don't necessarily know where they come from. They're just messages that come from all over the place, companies and other, other states and other recyclers. And I would just really um, emphasize that if you're not sure whether something is or is not recyclable, just check out our website or um, download our Recollect app. I downloaded that when I moved here and I wasn't working at Eureka yet, but I knew that the recycling system here in, in um, St. Paul was different than it was in Houston. So that app has been so helpful to me. There's this never ending exhaustive list of things that you can or cannot recycle on there, what we take curbside. Um, so if you're just not, if you're not sure, download our app or you can also just search those things on our website. Um, and just remember that it is the, it's about your local recycler and not about what is recyclable in general. That's, that matters. That's a really, really good point. It does make a difference on where you are and what recycler you're using. I really appreciate you for telling me that because I'm going to download that app and uh, we'll definitely share that on, on the MN Renewable Now uh, Facebook page and Instagram. And I'm sure Kyle is already doing it for Minneapolis Climate Action. She's over there. <laughs> awesome. Thanks, guys. <laughs> Thank you, Priscilla, so much for being here. It's so valuable for, um, for you being um, here to answer questions and talk about the work that you do. It's very, very valuable. And I think I'm so thankful for the work that you do. Um, yeah, and my family thanks you too. <laughs> so. Well, thank you. Thank you so much. I'm happy to be here um, in Minnesota and like on this panel. Just really happy to be here in general. So thanks. Cool. All right, so up next, we have our state representative, Frank Hornstein, who is the, the champion of the environment and um, all things um, green. And we are so, so happy to have him here. 
Um, every time I get to be in his presence, I'm always very, very happy. And he always makes me feel very welcome. Um, I view him as a brother and um, I will just kind of let him take, take it away and talk about some of the work that he is doing um, for our state. Well, thank you so much, Crystal. That was very wonderful introduction. And it's really great to see your face and, and, and all the great work that you do. And we have just all, all stars on this, on this call and on this panel. I'm just really honored to be with all of you tonight. And little known fact, um, Crystal was a student, uh, uh, Kyle was a student of mine um, in the sustainability studies program at the University of Minnesota, star student, and it's so great to see you uh, in your new role here. Um, and uh, I, I just, you know, I don't know if Stiv is still on, but um, that was an amazing film. I thought it was so powerful, and, and there were so many moments, I, and I jotted a few down and points that were made, but what was, I think, especially effective about this film is that it went, it, it, it went right after the source, right after these big corporations and helped us, I think, really understand, you know, how they're operating, the, the power that they have in the, in the political system and, and how to fight back. And so the other part that I loved is that it honored community organizers because, you know, we can win, we can push back and win. And I know Jenna Grove is uh, on the panel with Clean Water Action. I, I worked uh, for seven years at Clean Water Action as an organizer. And when we were there, we stopped the, a, a big incinerator project in Dakota County. And we did that with uh, grassroots organizing, with lobbying and working on elections. Just as Paul Wellstone said, if we're going to be successful in uh, fighting back on these issues, you have to have you know, a combination of those three things. He called it the Wellstone Triangle. So, um, so I remembered again that, that, you know, we can win and we, we beat these uh, uh, incinerator companies and, and, and all of their money and all of their power and all of their advertising uh, and all of the, the deceitful uh, messages that they, they constantly send about waste. Uh, but what I wanted to also mention is that, um, again, the, the film really talked about this whole plastics cycle, the life cycle, and it's so important. And just a couple of weeks ago, I was on a, a, vir in a virtual town meeting that the Pollution Control Agency had uh, related to the water permit that they are uh, interested in issuing uh, for the Line 3 tar dirty tar sands oil pipeline. And uh, what struck me, because you know it, it was like any other hearing, you have to wait in line for your turn to testify. And what struck me is the talking points of Enbridge Energy. Um, and that now this pipeline was needed even more because in the COVID-19 crisis, we need plastic masks for medical personnel and gowns. And so we need the pipeline to produce those plastic materials. And, you know, of course, the Department of Commerce, our own State Department of Commerce said this pipeline isn't needed. And, you know, we can go on about that. But, you know, from pipelines to incinerators, uh, we have to fight back, and there's an environmental justice component to all of these issues. And um, I'll, I'll conclude with, uh, again, something that Stiv said uh, in his comments. He used the term movement. And when we uh, are advocating on these issues, whether it's City Hall and getting our, our plastic uh, bag uh, uh, you know, ordinance in, in Minneapolis, or whether it's a state legislature and, and the great work that Jenna and others are doing there, or you know, at the national level, we have a, a national zero waste uh, bill uh, introduced. Um, wherever, whatever level of government or simply holding corporations accountable in local communities, you need a movement of people. We will only win with strong grassroots organizing. And so um, it just warms my heart uh, on this night uh, to be with all of you, because I think we all have to think of ourselves as movement builders. And I'm, you know, very happy to answer any questions. And, and again, just appreciate all of the work that's being done on this, on this issue, because we can win. We, uh, I have seen the, just the power uh, of organized people can beat the power of organized money. Uh, and um, it's really uh, encouraging. This, I think this film will really help, uh, help build our movement. Thank you. Awesome. I mean, Thank you. Oh, sorry. <laughs> that it's just definitely something that we want to build out of events like 
this is to really create a cohesive, I mean, there are so many activists and citizens and organizations that are working on this. And I think right now is such a ripe time to really bring all that together and to really focus on the state legislation that you are, you know, writing and authoring at the state capitol, um, Frank, on, on waste, and to really bring in that kind of trifecta of individual government and corporate kind of action and accountability. So, I mean, as much as it's a daunting time, it's truly a huge opportunity for us. And one other quick thing is I'm, I'm really glad to see the intersection of groups like the BIPOC table bringing in issues with, you know, the incinerator and zero waste and the environmental justice and racial justice all coming together in one group. Um, I, I did, you reminded me of one other point I wanted to make, um, which I'm again so glad this film did. You know, when um, uh, they were talking about the, the uh, asthma rates and the health impacts of uh, living near uh, these, uh, you know, incineration facilities and just in, in general, you know, again, you know, we are seeing the incredible, dis this COVID-19 crisis is exposing the incredible disparities you know, in our healthcare system, our education system, environment. And, um, you know, uh, the incinerator and other sources of toxic pollution are, uh, they, they trigger respiratory problems. And that's why I think uh, communities that live in the vicinity of these facilities are at particular risk for this disease. And mm -hmm. so I hope that you know, as we come out of this and, um, you know, start to, you know, address these problems that, that you know, environmental issues and, and building organizations and infrastructure like Eureka uh, really can and should be part of our recovery. And so, you know, there is something called the green stimulus that um, uh, has been circulated. It's a very uh, extensive open letter to Congress, and, and we need to get behind that. This, this crisis does provide an opportunity uh, to really address this issue. So I just wanted to make that point as well. Thank you, Representative Hornstein. I, I actually um, wanted to piggyback off that real quick and, and just kind of, I'm a North Side, North Minneapolis resident, and I raised my children in North Minneapolis, and I will say, you know, we're right by that incinerator, and um, there was a point when my children were in um, school and they were very young and every single child in their, um, their childcare room um, had a, a nebulizer um, to deal with chronic bronchitis. Um, and, and so it's, it's not a mistake. It's not, it's not just like a coincidence that um, we have the highest rate of, um, asthma and chronic bronchitis in the entire state of Minnesota in North Minneapolis um, when we are situated right next to an incinerator. Um, I wanted to, um, Sean actually, Sean, hello Sean, um, he is with Alliance for Sustainability, um, awesome dude that I've had the chance to work with um, and still do, um, and he had a question. He said, um, Representative Frank, my chief a new zero waste bill for 2021 that we can check out. Yes, yeah, so, um, you know, I've been working on this for a couple of years. Um, you know, the idea, you know, really originated with Congressman Ellison when he was back in Congress, now Attorney General Ellison, and he introduced the national uh, bill. And I think that we need to have, um, you know, a, a real comprehensive approach. I mean, we have to have the extended producer responsibility. Uh, there's also legislation that never really got off the ground this year, but a number of people were working on it to make sure that we're labeling what is truly compostable, that we're not just encouraging the plastics industry. Again, so many things this film brought out, right? Mm -hmm. um, it, you know, there's so many uh, products that people think are compostable. We have to have standards, um, you know, and, and of course, waste reduction and really a serious effort to phase out this downtown garbage incinerator because so much of that facility relies on things that can be recycled. And as long as that is there or composted, and as long as that is there, uh, we really um, are going to be, um, you know, facing an uphill fight. We, we have to phase out that facility. Uh, and the fact that the 
energy, which is not very much, by the way, uh, and is heavily subsidized and expensive, the energy that comes out of that uh, facility is considered in state law to be uh, green energy, to be renewable energy, equivalent to wind and solar. I mean, and that is, you know, that is again the, the, the result of lobbying in, 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 at the midnight hour at the legislature by some powerful interests that slipped that into a bill, you know, without a lot of public conversation and discussion. So I think that, again, uh, you had mentioned, I, I think, uh, Crystal, that there is just now that with the BIPOC table and a whole group of younger, energetic activists. Uh, from the north side and, are, and around town. Copal is doing wonderful work in this area. Uh, there's an environmental justice bill that Representative Her is uh, organized, had a, a fantastic hearing on that. There's so much energy and activity that quite frankly, I have not seen in a couple decades around this set of issues, you know, at the Capitol and in the community, you know, with a new generation of incredible activists. So I'm optimistic, but Sean, to your question, yes, uh, there is a bill. I, I I've introduced it. I don't remember what the bill number is. Uh, and it is something that I know Eureka has helped put together. Uh, and, um, you know, we are going to, um, you know, look at that and, and some other, uh, uh, other legislation next year. But we, we have to make sure that incineration is not considered renewable energy. That is an absolute travesty. And yeah, I think we start with that and, and, and move on to some other things. I don't think so. I, I agree. Um, Wendy had a question. Um, she said, Frank, I think one of the biggest hurdles to face is that of overwhelm. I'm the co-president of the board of Minneapolis Climate Action and single-use plastics is my pet peeve. But when I see films like this, as wonderful as they are, I find myself just feeling so overwhelmed by the hugeness of this issue. How can we help to make this really seem doable to consumers? Well, I mean, again, thank you for the question. Um, I, I think that we have, again, I'm gonna go back to, to where I started. I mean, we have really good grassroots organizations that people can join and, and get involved with because, yes, it, it, when I worked with a group of citizens in Dakota County, it was overwhelming. How do you stop a 600 ton a day garbage burner with just a motley group of citizens? And we were going up against the 30th largest corporation in the world that was building this uh, facility and every layer of government was bought into this and they had endless money and lobbyists, but we could win. So I think we have to pick some very specific and strategic uh, issue areas that we can work on and organize around. And, you know, there are great groups working at the Capitol. I know that in a, a couple of minutes, Jen is gonna talk about uh, the work that Clean Water Action is doing there on, on PFAS and, and some other issues. Um, and, and, you know, I think that there, there is an agenda. We work together to create agenda. For the first time in many years, we had a meeting before the session at Eureka, and we mapped out very specifically what are some areas of focus and, and who was going to do it. So there is now, on the set of issues that was in this film, a, a growing grassroots movement. And I think to join that effort, we need all hands on deck. And, and to join that effort and build that effort as we head you know, into the next session. You know, we could be doing a campaign on Hennepin County or the city of Minneapolis. Uh, we need to think through strategically what we can do, but I know I'm so confident this group of people that's coming together can, can achieve some really good victories on this. Thank you so much. Oh, sorry, Priscilla, did you wanna say something? Sure, I just wanna add that, um, you know, I think through policies that are being proposed through individual action, more of these zero waste cities that are popping up. I think all of that collectively is sending a message to these companies that are looking to produce more plastic and more importantly to their investors. Um, so the Brave Free From Plastic movement has been really great about sort of con um, uh, collecting all of the articles, stories that have come out from cities all across the country and the world that are really emphasizing this fact that consumers are not looking for plastic. We're not asking for it, we're not demanding it, and it's in fact the opposite. So I think all of that mess, collective messaging too um, is, is sending a signal that this is not what we want. Um, so I think it goes to that you know, strategic plan of what we're, you know, what we're doing here locally, but also how that um, ties into what's happening across the country as well. 
Well, thank you, uh, Representative Hornstein, for um, for being here. And I, I hope you can stick around. If you have to go, I totally understand. Oh, no, I, I, I've got nowhere to go. I'm, I'm very happy being here with all of you. Thank you so much. And um, up next, we have Jenna Grove from Clean Water Action. It's a nonprofit that focuses on clean and safe uh, drinking water and um, our bodies of water. And they work on legislation and work with our wonderful legislators to make sure that is possible. So Jenna, take it away. All right, thank you for that. Um, I appreciate everyone, uh, including me on the panel today. I think that's something I really appreciated in the documentary is showing the scale. And to the previous question about being overwhelmed, um, it really is simple. There's a big difference between the meaningfulness and importance of individual action and a solution. Um, those individual actions are powerful in the way that there is strength in numbers. And I know that Priscilla mentioned it, the consumers aren't asking for this and the retailers are going to listen. So individuals speaking up, making sure that they're doing their part is contributing to a market shift, which um, may irritate the industry, but it has shown to be effective in terms of companies voluntarily phasing out certain chemicals in their products or adopting um, more sustainable business practices. Um, but when it comes to a solution, when you have a large scale problem like this that's impacting the environment and public health, you really look to the source and we all know what it is. And the unfortunate aspect of it all is that the, this, these single use plastics, and I know that it was spoken about in the documentary, really is toxic in the entirety of its life cycle. And the processes involved in the manufacturing are significant contributors to anthropogenic climate change. So when we talk about that narrative that um, the industry has been very successful with throughout the past three decades is that the blame game, right? Um, consumers need to do this. Recycling's the answer, not bans. Um, I believe it was in 1988 when the first county implemented a bag ban. There was a an industry attorney who said that we're going to look back years from now, and 1988 is going to be the defining, uh, well, the start of a solid waste and packaging war. Here we are 32 years later, and that's the case. They've done a very good job, um, you know, with a very specific message. But just because they've been on message for three decades does not mean it's factual. The unfortunate aspect is when we have advocates out here, we have people fighting for, for authentic change, they are demonized by the industry. The messaging is that they are alarmists because there's no way that an industry could possibly knowingly do this to a society. But the reality is it's not being alarmist, it's fact. And the chemical industry and the plastics industry has been misrepresenting the safety and their methods as trying to help be helpful, you know, better living through chemistry, plastic being cost effective, more often than not, their lies. Touting single use plastics as cost effective is just another lie in a string of false information. Because when you look at the cost of single use plastics, the health costs, the environmental remediation costs, the true cost is, those things aren't reflected in, in single-use plastics market price. It's, so on paper, it might look that way, but in reality, it's not. And um, the number of chemicals used in these single-use plastics, most of them have not been tested for their impacts on human health. And those that have, 
have shown to cause very adverse health effects, whether it be from developmental disorders, cancers, um, asthma, as previously mentioned. And of course, they're going to deny and not take accountability and take steps to fix what they've done because they've been on record for so long saying that this is a good thing and we just need people to do their part in the cycle. And I think I really appreciate what Priscilla said about um, you know, educating folks on how to recycle and making sure that um, they're doing it in a way that's going to you know, help with the waste problem as a response to the immediate problem, the immediate waste stream that we're dealing with. But in order for something to change, it's going to have to be a, I mean, a monumental shift in economic structure and I mean, all the way down to campaign finance reform, to be blunt. Because a lot of the power the, these industries have is their ability to exploit deficiencies in our system, whether it be stopping a bill easily in a state legislature due to extreme partisanship that polarizes issues that really everyone should agree on in the first place. I think it really speaks to everyone who's passionate about these issues because the advocates fighting tirelessly are doing it for the sake of protecting the environment and public health. Whereas the opponents of these initiatives have a vested interest and we all know what that is, the insane amount of money that is lining their pockets. Um, so um, Sean had a question for you. I gotta scroll back up to it because there's there's a lot of wonderful chatting going on in, in uh, this group. Um, you hit a lot of really great points. Um, Sean had said, um, gotta go back up to it. Oh, Hennepin County and Ramsey County are investigating biodigesting organic waste. Is it a good idea? And Ashan, if you wanted to uh, unmute yourself to break break down what you're asking to the gentleman. Oh, well, part of it is the dealing with the organics part of the waste stream. And you're not sure whether they can get the organic material started well enough to make it worthwhile. Um, Are you talking about anaerobic digestion? Yeah, anaerobic digestion, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that is an efficient method that a lot of wastewater treatment facilities use and are already using. Yeah. But I cannot speak to um, what the Hennepin County is. I just haven't, I haven't seen it. So I wish I could answer that question better for you. They're, they're looking at it quite a lot through the, the Newport facility with Ramsey in Washington County. And um, Anyway, but uh, that was something that when we were, they had a call with um, one of the Hennepin County commissioners uh, about it, and she's the one from Bloomington, and she was mentioning that idea. But that's still just dealing with organic waste, which is not, you know, all this people use plastic, which is a lot of the waste stream that we can't recycle right now. Yeah. One one question I had was um, really, really just bothers me, and this is because I, I lead a lot of cleanups with youth throughout the summertime, and it always bothered me. You know, we we there was a time where when we flushed our toilets or when water went down the drain, <clears throat> it didn't get filtered and it goes straight went straight into the river. There was like one there was a, a statistic that said like one um, living species was living in the Mississippi River between um, like Blaine and the end of Minneapolis or something like that. But they were able to change that. But the thing is, is the storm water. The storm water really bothers me because there's a lot of pollution on the streets. Um, and not just the trash that people are dropping, but the oil that comes from our cars and the salt that's on the street. And you know, that stuff goes right into our waterways, our streams, our rivers, our lakes. Is there anything out there that addresses that? Um, 
as far as filtering that, um, is there anything out there that's, that we can, you know, keep our eye open for? So that's another um, significant problem. When I said that there's going to need to be a significant um, shift in how our economic and our budgets are, are done every two years, um, our wastewater treatment facilities already are are already needing upgrades to keep up with some of these contaminants and cannot treat some of these contaminants. You mentioned the salt. Well, chloride permanently pollutes water. I believe it's like one tablespoon for five gallons. And the only um, way to treat it is just not fiscally feasible because our in water infrastructure um, is so far off from being adequately funded that it's almost laughable, but not because it's, it's causing a lot of problems like lead service lines alone. Lead poisoning in children is, if you've seen it, you would be ripping up all of those out of the ground. Um, honestly, we need to invest more in making sure that our wastewater treatment facilities have the equipment and the means to treat the water for these emerging contaminants. Um, but, you know, as we've seen throughout the last, um, you know, even just the last five years, the cuts are consistently being made to agencies that are charged with that responsibility um, of regulating and testing our water. Um, so, I mean, a, until we see some kind of change, we really need to be focused on stopping the contamination before it gets into the water because we all live downstream and we are all connected. These chemicals are ending up, you know, the plastics break down, the chemicals end up in the water, they end up in our soil, they end up in our food supply, they end up in our body. So, it really does need to start, the, the change needs to start at the source. And until the chemical and plastics and fossil fuel industry are held accountable, and there's some expectation that the products, if the products you're producing end up not being safe for the environment or safe for public health, we need to be able to ban them or at least do a moratorium and let you go back to the drawing board. But as we've seen, the industry's ego is far too large to admit any wrongdoing and um, their fear of liability for exposure and knowing the terrible things that these exposures can cause, I just don't see it happening voluntarily. Their track record supports that statement. You know, I just want to jump in and say it's 9.30. I know I could keep going for a while, but I want to yeah. back to the panelists who um, have um, come on. So we understand if you have to go, but, um, you know, I'm willing to keep on going for a little while. Um, I do want to say very quickly before I see if anybody who hasn't asked a question yet has one, um, that, again, we will send out a recording of this event. We will send out a resource guide with hopefully everything that all of us have, have talked about is on there. And also, um, Christelle and I have a, um, in collaboration with others, this is not something that, you know, we are doing. We're really wanting to collaborate. We have a zero waste kind of committee kickoff meeting on June 1st. And I shared um, that Facebook event with people and we'll share it with others. But does anyone have a question that and you can go ahead and unmute yourself. I think there are few enough people that if you have a question. I had an exciting and Sean, news at the National Night Out. Can we see if someone who hasn't asked a question yet? Um, oh, sure, yeah. Anybody? Brigitte, anybody? You know, Andrea, everybody good? I, I guess um, I have a question. I'd, I'll go ahead, Chris. Oh, I'm sorry. I just wanted to apologize because my connection's unstable and I'm going to make an adjustment to my location in my house. <laughs> Go ahead, Emily. Hey, thanks, Kyle. Thanks, you guys, for hosting this. I, uh, I appreciate this conversation a lot. 
I work for the city of St. Louis Park in recycling and I do I've tried to push my job more into the waste prevention realm because lar largely a lot of the issues we're talking about. One of the issues I struggle with though, and it's it gets to kind of that question of like, there's so much stuff and there's so many different places you can be and there's so many things. It feels like having all these, like how do you juggle it all? How do you prioritize, especially politically? So Representative Hornstein, when you talk about like the political things, and as Kyle knows, I'm not a bag band fan for because I think it's wasted political capital. I personally think there are better things to spend that energy on. But that said, one of the other things I struggle with is, you know, I think about like the fashion industry, right? And a lot of that is plastic. A lot of our clothing is plastic. Nobody really likes to think about it that way. I but don't want it. at least 50% of our clothing don't fabric. Want investigate fibers. the factory farms. They don't want to investigate Enbridge. You think they're going to do shit for us. Oh. Yes, there's a, there's a whole lot of things. But one of the, the reason I bring that up is I think the single use plastics issue is really, um, it, it gets an important amount of attention and it should, and I don't think that it's not something we should work on, but I think about like clothing and fast fashion and that how clothing has become such a essentially single use item for all intents and purposes when you look at the energy that goes to that. And so one of the things that I, you know, try to think about is where, where our best, our energy is best spent. And I know that there's enough of us out there that maybe we can work on all those things. But one of the things I would like to see is more like extended, extended producer responsibility around plastic clothing and, and the issues. I mean, look at the microplastics issue every time you wash plastic clothing, right? And that's not getting filtered out in our wastewater treatment plants and all of these other issues. And so I don't know if it's really a question or more just of a statement in terms of like priorities, because as we know, getting things through a capital either at a state level or at a federal level, which is laughable at this point, unfortunately, in some ways. Um, I guess I'd just be curious if folks have thoughts on that and sort of like, you know, or there's other categories of things too. Like I, I work on building materials and it's like one house, if you tear it on one house and don't salvage the materials, that is like thousands and thousands of styrofoam containers worth of environmental pollution and environmental input. And we don't have a policy on requiring deconstruction in the state or most states, even cities don't really have it. And so again, like this is where I struggle. And I think Christelle, maybe you sort of that said that too, of like there's so many things to work on and how do we prioritize that, especially from a political perspective that, and it, it does, you know, admittedly on a global scale, it looks different in different places for a variety of reasons. I think China shutting down to US waste was one of the best things that happened on this planet um, mm -hmm. because it forces it back here and Europe to Europe too. Um, but anyway, that's just kind of my comment slash statement. I, I think, again, I think there's a lot of us that we all could be working on this type of thing, but I'd be curious on if folks have thoughts on that. Well, Emily, yeah. let me say quickly that that's one of the reasons we wanted to do this kind of event was to get some of the top organizers, activists, representatives, and really fine tune and of course, this will never be perfect. It will be one slice of action to do. But I know even for myself, I work in this field every day and I get overwhelmed and I need this for myself as well. What critical piece of legislation can we get behind? What critical piece of you know, city policy can we get behind? What are the top five actions we could take as citizens? I don't like to call myself a consumer all the time because I consider myself a citizen that sometimes you know that consumes things but i'm not a capitalist consumer in that sense that's my you know rah rah statement about myself but anyway i just i hear you about and wendy talked about this earlier you know this feeling of being overwhelmed and can we make some decisions to focus on some critical aspects that maybe have the most chance of passing and have the most effect um, so yeah, that's, that's why we pulled this together. I have one, one comment. So I, I don't know, I'm not super educated about this. Um, but I feel like one way 
to get behind a lot of this really is carbon taxing. Um, or maybe it's plastics taxing. I don't know. It's probably the same thing. But I just feel like if you really want to get down to it, it what what those corporations have to offer consumers is so enticing. It I know what you're saying is true, Jenna, that in the um the long run the cost is more, but in the grocery store or at Walmart, the cost is not more. It's so much easier to buy that inexpensive plastic clothing or that laundry detergent that's in the big plastic tub. So, you know, money talks. Right. But that's, they, that's, it's that way for a reason. Um, the pricing of products, the materials they use, um, that's what they, that's part of the thing. That they, that's one of the aspects they rely on. Absolutely. Think, um, yeah. And yeah, I mean, you're absolutely right. In terms of a consumer going to the store, and that goes back to what I mentioned earlier about the power of being a consumer and being vocal about what you need and want as a consumer and um, speaking out against some of these, some of these terrible things that have happened in terms of the chemical companies that are, you know, multi-million dollar lawsuits, but not act, actually doing anything. That's just, you know, pennies to them. But yet on the on the narrative side, they have they've, you know, kind of paid back society. It is really what is that the real cost of convenience facing by these plastics. They make it so easy and so affordable when you're in the store. Um, that I mean it's hard. And especially for families living on um, than budgets you know it's just they rely on that being people's only option which does speak to a larger issue about um you know obviously a living wage and those kind of things which are always just caught up in perpetual arguments at the legislature so it really is something that um spans almost every aspect of public policy. Um, if I can jump in here, I wanted to uh, address something, um, Emily, that you brought up about um, plastic bans and prioritizing policy. So Eureka, like we really thought about in terms of our um, uh, policy and, or our strategic plan in, in terms of policy is really getting at the low hanging fruit. And so for us, like plastic bags, at Eureka, we spend six staff hours a day dealing with plastic bags that get stuck in our um, uh, in our in our system, and so a yearly that totals about seventy five thousand dollars a year. And when you see things like um, when you see policies in places like DC, for example, that instituted a five cent fee on bags, within the first year they saw sixty percent reduction in plastic bags. So again, it's getting at like the things that we um, know are achievable and know that have um, benefits, not just to our environment, but to um, you know, local recyclers um, and, and things like that. I think those are, those are really important to, to get at. And so focusing on what, you know, what the low hanging fruit is now, while we work on sort of this movement building for, you know, piece that gets at the systemic change, I think is, sort of like a both and, right? We can do both things um, and still achieve our goals in terms of reducing plastic waste. That's a really good point, Priscilla. I, I, to put that in numbers is awesome. I just, wow, six hours a day. Um, so I want to again, thank our panelists so much. Uh, Representative Hornstein, Jenna, Priscilla, Stiv, all of you, are amazing. You do amazing work in our community. We we owe you so much. Um, and we just are so blessed to have you. And we, we thank you for being here tonight and, um, and talking about this very, very, very important issue. I hope everyone that is in this um, conversation will take this conversation and go and talk to a couple people that they love and are dear to them or someone they know um, about what we talked about today. Um, and Kyle, um, she wanted to mention 
um, a committee that we started. So before we leave, before you guys leave, we have a committee that is um, that we're kicking off. And Kyle, if you wanted to to mention that real quick before we end this amazing conversation. Yeah, absolutely. And I did share the um, Facebook event that I just published. We'll see. I assume it may be a virtual event again. Um, ideally, it would be all together, but we'll have to see. Um, and or even if we are in the same room with social distancing, whatever. We'll figure that out. But either way, we want to get together and really bring together, I think, some of the um, issues, legislation, actions that we can take. And really, I, it was so great to get the temperature of um, all the different activists and organizations and, and Representative Hornstein. Um, and I know that we have allies in the city as well. There's definitely city policy that we can be working on. So we will, we're will. we doing that on um, June 1st. I sent out um, the Facebook event in the chat. I'll also send it you know, with the follow-up. Um, we're also doing this again next Friday, Christelle and I. We just can't get enough. <laughs> And we're hoping to get um, some other awesome speakers lined up. We have some invites out. Um, so tell your friends. Um, you can yeah. get info on it, you know, with MN Renewable Now, Minneapolis Climate Action, and anyone else here who wants to, you know, be co-hosts of these events with us, whether it's Clean Water Action, Eureka, you know, anybody. I mean, this truly needs to be collaborative. And, and again, Stiv mentioned earlier about distributed leadership. Like we're all leaders here. We yep. are all like the solution, you know, right here in our in our own community. I truly believe that. So yeah, and definitely we have our kickoff committee on June 5th first, and then um, the another event next week. Yes, yes. And um, yeah, so next Friday, if you guys wanna, uh, tune back in and, or let your, your friends know. I have a quarantine movie date uh, next Friday and show them this film. That would be great to see you guys again and see your friends here um, so that we can continue this conversation and help our representative over there, Frank, um, with uh, <laughs> his hard work. He needs us to be showing up at the Capitol um, yep. so he can, we can make his job a little bit easier. So, awesome. Good night, everybody. This is this was great, and it's now nice. all in my house. <laughs> hey, thanks everyone. Bye. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Care. Wonderful to see everybody. This was awesome. Thank you. See you later. Bye. Peace. Thank you so much. <laughs>
I have the whole thing. You do? Yeah. I wonder why it would only let me scroll back to 9.33. But I also saved it. Okay, good. Well, as I'll long as you saved it, I trust that. I'll just do copy paste too. We don't need to, we don't need to do two things. Um, cool. Well, that was very successful. Uh, wait, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to end this meeting and we can chat. Okay. Bye, Mary.